Hello, everyone. Welcome to you talk where we couple of uh well i'm not sure what to call us whether it be intellectuals morons who have cameras and microphones or somewhere in the middle but either way we're going to talk to you about some things that are important to us and we hope are important to you and today we are going to ask a question which has a very odd answer that question is what can government do to end poverty permanently? We have just talked about the undue influence of money on absolutely everything, but that doesn't change the fundamental fact that without money, it's real hard to live. And yes, there are many who are even even looking mostly sort of functional, you know, holding down housing and the like. You shouldn't have to choose between like being able to replace something that's broken and feeding your kids and there are mm. i have a friend whose whose car battery has just died she, she's a nurse she doesn't get paid for about a week at this point so she's without transport to her work like you need money to be able to live you need to spend money to make money in the context of having the money to get to work poverty is is not always someone on a street corner with a cardboard sign and a kind of tattered looking dog that's stayed by their side. Yeah. It's, it's crappy living conditions. You know, it's, it's living in a, it's living in a shit studio apartment where your rent gets raised by 50%, you know, and, and you're you too, basically huh? having a terrible life. Yes. That, that is, you know, I'm moving out in a couple of weeks for that reason. Um, but you know, like that's that's a personal example, but I'm sure it's a personal example that a great many people, and particularly in Sydney, um, can can relate to right now. Yeah, our landlords but, but, have just jacked the rents considerably, and I sort of have to ask, you know, I understand a return on investment, but what the fuck have they actually invested? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Because they're not fixing you know, things. We, like last ep- last episode, we were talking about how um, how society has been so commercialized. And, you know, we've commercialized one of the three basic needs of humanity. You need food, water, and shelter. And, I mean, food is commercialized, but still, you know, cheap for the most part. Although that's Shit raising food the price. Is cheap. Well, if you food know how to with... cook really well, you you know, it's it's not too expensive. But, you know, not everyone no, honestly, has luxury. Honestly, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Who has time for that? But like, food, food of well, that's that's a good well, nutritive that's... value is not that cheap. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, perhaps we should have done a part two to that video because you know there's still so much more to say on that. But this is there is there is one huge point that we need to get across before we can really even begin to answer the question of how government can end poverty, and people need to understand this. Because this has been a a marketing campaign slogan for the party of commercial interests in Australia. Government is not a fucking business. Government is not a business. It should not be treated as a business. The very idea of government is that we all put in a little so that we all get out a lot. It is a collective effort run by elected representatives to ensure that everyone has basic needs met, whether those basic needs be food, water, shelter, fundamental health care. Those basics need to be met. And I don't know about everyone else, but I don't think it's too silly to say that those should be seen as fundamental rights. That somebody living on the street or somebody living in poor conditions and not able to afford any any modicum of dignity in their life, at least in my mind, is a breach of human rights. And government, I believe that the being United treated Nations... like a business in a, in a second, and government being treated like a business 
is at the, is is very much at the core of why we're seeing these these sorts of problems. Very much the core of why we are seeing what I would consider to be human rights completely abandoned or even stripped away at times for the sake of commercial gain. I would argue that the uh, United Nations Human Rights Commission would agree with you that that every person should have the right to uh, liberty, or, or what we would more accurately describe as self-determination, the ability mm. to chart their own course in life without, that, for instance, I... like being married off for money. Um, on, on that, if security. I can actually. On, on that one, if I can actually. Because that's been something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And thinking of I... being married for money? I have no, some no, very no, nice goats here. No, li- liberty and self-determination. Because we we think we have self-determination. But I'd argue that we don't. Just think about it. Social mobility has died. You either have to accidentally create the next flappy bird, which is impossible to predict and impossible to work towards, or you end up living a life which is locked into a very tight set of constraints, paying high rent with not much room to save money you know unless unless you got into the workforce 20 years ago which you know i was i was a bit late for that i was about what almost 15 years ago now about 13 14 so i was too late for that and i got into the workforce at the age of 15 you know i my my first job was at, at maccas and then kfc I couldn't wait to enter the workforce, start working and start pushing my life forward. And even with that, I've seen... Look where we are now. Yeah, look where I am. Look where all of us are. There's The social mobility is dead. You know, the the idea that the Australian dream is dead. Do you think if we had social mobility, we'd be here making a podcast slash show uploading to youtube complaining about the fact that the world is broken no if we had social mobility we'd be living the life of fucking riley this is riley who's riley i i don't know that old saying Uh, Um, okay tell me how social mobility and self-determination like self-determination is in the context of the human rights commission about not being married off for a dowry being able to chart your own course but Carl's right to extend that to the fact that if, Isn't if you have artificial if you barriers, have any choice. Yeah, yeah. if you have artificial barriers placed to limit how you can navigate your way through life, then self-determination really, isn't self-determination. as meaningful as it sounds. Yeah, I mean, well, it's not even, is it meaningful? No, like, you still, you you still have always have the choice to make the best of the circumstances you're in, right? Self-determination, yeah, you? when we talk I about mean, that, no, no, stop for a second. Self-determination in this context isn't about the circumstances. It's about being able to make your own choices. And you're, I, I get what you're saying. If if certain choices are blocked off from you by larger things, then your self-determination is impeded. But at the same time, that's a much larger issue. Uh, and the poverty side of things, which I'd, I'd like to come back to, when we're talking about having, we, we got distracted by the self-determination there. The other things that they say are, are important are safety and access to, like, food, water, shelter. See, the, these are, are human things. rights, and they've been commercialized. Yeah, and, and they're, I mean, they're very basic. And, you know, it's it's... Like, I've been thinking about this because I've been thinking about how, um, you know, productivity has soared since, since what, since the 80s. And, you know, productivity has increased, like, by well over, you know, like, a thousand percent. Like, it's, it's, it's gone through the roof. And yet, wages just haven't been raised to match. And so, what, what we're seeing is, you know, I mean, hell, wait, like, wages 
in a lot of in a lot of areas aren't even matching the the in the increase in the cost of living. So the gap is apparently around about 1978-79. Between 1948, Mm. so just after World War II, which I will remind you created a brief economic depression as the world rebuilt. Mm. From 48 to 79, productivity and workers' wages tracked more or less in relation to each other. Uh, Productivity Mm. was up 118% and wages were up 108 percent yeah so one that's, thing that's that comes pretty to mind solid, but 1979 yeah, one, one, to 2021 is what i'm getting at yeah. here what and one thing changed. that comes to mind if i if i can one thing that comes to mind is i remember hearing and tech this is technically in the u.s but i i think it would be similar here um please correct me if i'm wrong but mm-hmm. in the like 50s and, and early 60s i think it was that in the US, um, you could work at a at a petrol station and you could afford to buy a house off of your wage there. Yeah, like, this is this is uh, the thing with, with the Simpsons, station. right? This is the thing with the Simpsons. Homer Simpson is a technician at a nuclear plant. He's not even very good at his job, if we're being honest. And he mm-hmm. is managing to support himself his wife, three kids, three children own a nice home in the suburbs outright and still have the money to go down to the pub and have a beer with friends. Yeah. That was quite a lot of of beers. And the Simpsons started. That was normal. Now that is a pipe dream. I literally thinking the exact same words. Uh, But I would, I would like to jump back because uh, the other half of that statistic I was referencing is that from 1979 to 2021, net productivity, and I believe this is in the US, but it is reflected very well over here, um, net productivity increased 65%. Workers' compensation only increased 17%. And you can actually see, I'm looking at the lines on a graph right now, that they're diverging more and more extremely as you go forward. And this mm. is the Economic Policy Institute calling out explicitly that it's policy choices that have led to yeah. the situation, which means that policy choices can bring us back. Yes. Yes. And, and you know, like another thing that actually just uh, just came up, I, I forget who coined this term, um, but the idea of a wage slave that you can be paid a wage and effectively be a slave because you spend all of your time either working, you know, or sleeping because you get yeah, paid that. Yeah, that's basically that indentured load. servitude, but fancier. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it, and, and it's, it's so, it almost comes, like to me, it seems insidious even because you can be that and not even, not even know it. You know, and it can so be normalized. The, this normalized. In the original context, um, the original term was by French journalist Simone Gay, um, but in the English-speaking world, it was popularized by none other than Emma Goldman, who those of you who have read a book or two may recall was an uppity little shit anarcho-communist who nonetheless made some very good points about how society was broken and about how we as humans owed each other so much better. I mean, I'm not going to lie, I'd shit over communists. You know, I'd, I'd shit on communists quite a lot, but you know, in, in that regard, at least, she's got she's hit it, hit the nail on the head. She's spot on. You know, I've I've always <clears throat> it's kind of funny because it's like Communists end up getting like identifying the problem, or at least the basics of the problem, quite well. But you know, the, the problem solution... with communism, the problem with communism, uh, I'm gonna upset any communists watching. Like, nah, allow, allow, allow me. The problem with communism you'll is haven't they figured out how to make it work. the answer, and that's a dumb. No, shit no, 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 no. That's not correct. That's anarchism, and that's a different set of problems. The problem with communism is that you can build systems all you like, 
but bastards will find a way to exploit it. And I think a lot of communists believe that human nature is corrupted because of systems instead of seeing that systems have opportunities and opportunists take advantage and that it is a continual fight you can't just put the system in place. I, you have I, to I have gotta, a system which continues in. holding people accountable. Otherwise, they'll yeah. just be corrupt and wreck it all. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta jump in and say it. the devil's in the detail. <clears throat> like you know, it's you, you like the it's it's kind of like a video game. There's going to be breaks in the game. There's going to be glitches. You need to patch it continuously in order to account for that. It's an ongoing process. A systems change is not the answer. That's like saying it. That's I like mean, saying it is the answer, but not like bad, that. So you need to change it to a JRPG. You know, your first person shooter isn't working, so you need to change it to a narrative driven, turn based RPG. No, that's not the answer. You're just I going mean, that to. might actually you're just going legitimately to fix some games. Well, <laughs> that's another conversation. Yeah, but, but like, yeah, the, is, the, the, the thing is. The continual patching thing is we've heard in history that communist states have failed because they didn't reach full communism. What the mm. fuck is full communism? Like humanity at any point no, they, should be in a perpetual state of improvement. You can't just you can't see, just do the work once, call it done, and then hope that it's smooth sailing forever. You've got to keep working for it. I mean, look, there there may be per- permanent changes that you can make, mm-hmm. you know, such as the constitutional amendments we've talked about, which we should really do an episode on. Um, but you know, the at the core of it. You know, their like their solution is is co- to completely go against human nature. Human nature is one where they where the human nature is that where that is that which <clears throat> exploits will be found because it because it is human nature to do so. To it is human quote... nature to find exploits to find a, a an easier, cheaper way of of getting ahead with less investment, less time. You know, a uh, kind of, you know, we want to take shortcuts by nature, and for some people, taking a shortcut and uh, is looked at exactly the same way as being a corrupt motherfucker who doesn't give a shit about your your peers or or anyone around you. Sorry, hang on. I just figured out how to describe the intersection of human nature and policy here. Right? Hmm? It's it's really simple. I'm I'm going to just have to horribly butcher both the Bloodhound Gang and Paul Keating. <laughs> I'm excited you to and see me, where this goes. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do you slowly. You know what? That could very much be a a slogan for for the liberals. Commercial interest. Well, I was going to say how commercial interests treat society. But the Liberal Party is basically the party of of huge commercial interests. And huge commercial interests are corporations, machines that don't give a shit about people. Yes. And so that, you know, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it's 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 well butchered, like you said, but it does make perfect sense. And with that, we've run out of time. So I guess we'll end it there. Thank you for watching. Please share this around. We need more than 15 views a video if we are Paul going Keating, to change If you're actually this watching this, we love you. Please come back. We need someone to shit talk these idiots. Uh, did you, see, you know what? You know what? I wanna I wanna talk about, you know, what he was saying about the subs, but we don't have time. Catch you later, everyone. See ya.